Hello and welcome back to Clem's Content Corner, the number one place for Line of Duty content on YouTube. Firstly, apologies for the lack of content recently. I took a few months hiatus through the winter, but with Line of Duty returning to your screens for Season 6 on the 21st of March 2021, I thought now would be a good time to try and resume more regular releases, starting today with a quick recap of each season up to this point, what we know about the coming season, and some hopes and predictions for what lies ahead. So, Line of Duty, as I expect we all know, is a police drama written by Jed Mercurio, following the work of AC-12, an anti-corruption unit in an unnamed English city as they try to bring corrupt police officers to justice. In the close to nine years on our screens, the team have gradually uncovered a massively elaborate and well-connected organised crime gang in the city, who have consistently found ways to infiltrate the police and manipulate officers into doing their bidding, with a wide range of motives for those involved. Having got this far, the AC-12 team now need to capture Itch, the elusive and mysterious figure at the helm of the OCG, with Season 6 set to be a battle of wits against an adversary who can use their police connections to remain one step ahead of the officers trying to stop them at all times. So let's look back on the series and remind ourselves how we got to this point. Season 1 began with AC-12 investigating the decorated officer DCI Tony Gates, accused of skewing the figures for his own gain. Kate went undercover in his team and discovered that this was the tip of the iceberg, with Gates interfering with investigations to lead them away from organised crime. This was because the OCG syndicate, led by Tommy Hunter, were threatening to frame Gates for the murder of his lover, Jackie Laverty, having killed her themselves and preserved her remains laden with Tony's DNA as evidence. Tony becomes determined to bring in Hunter himself, and successfully tricks him into confessing to his involvement in the murder of Wesley Duke. But knowing that his life had been ruined regardless of what happened to Hunter, having been kicked out of his house by his wife and his career facing the axe, Gates commits suicide, instructing Steve to attest to the claim that he died in the line of duty, securing financial support to Tony's family. We also learned that Tony was not the only inside man for the OCG, with Dot being an ally of Tommy Hunter and a long-standing OCG agent within the police. It was in fact DS Cotton who suspended surveillance on Greek Lane all along, rather than Tony, and it was this twist that opened up so many avenues for where they could take the series in future seasons with the real bent copper climbing the police ladder by becoming an inspector. If some parts were a little rougher around the edges in this first season, it was still a pretty thrilling watch, forming the outline that would be expanded upon in the seasons to come. In Season 2, Detective Inspector Lindsay Denton is investigated for her part in a fatal ambush, whilst moving a protected witness who later turns out to be Tommy Hunter, with Hunter having turned informant following the events of Season 1. As inquiries continue and D.I. Denton's life is turned upside down, Lindsay follows a case of her own, the disappearance of 15-year-old Carly Kirk. The plot threads are revealed to be two sides of the same coin, with Carly having fled the city when marked for death by the OCG, with Hunter attempting to blackmail Deputy Chief Constable Mike Dryden with the threat of framing him for her murder in an attempt to regain influence over the police once more. Lindsay complied to facilitate the ambush, believing that Hunter was incapable of change, didn't deserve the immunity he had been granted, and that he would kill Carly if he wasn't stopped. We also learn that Dot was the one who orchestrated the ambush, not wanting to risk Tommy Hunter giving away any information that could reveal his identity as an OCG mole. This coincides with Dot being kept on the AC-12 team permanently, embedding him in the heart of the unit that is trying to flush him out, and we also learn that the OCG has been coercing more police officers into helping them, with Manish Prasad and Jeremy Cole both made to kill on the gang's behalf. Season 2 was a very natural progression from the first season. On top of D.I. Denton being my own personal favourite character, the second season also succeeds in giving the OCG's internal workings a bit more shape, showing how ruthless they can be to their own, and that once your use to them has expired, they would sooner put you in the ground than risk what you know falling into the wrong hands. Season 3 saw the team investigating Police Sergeant Danny Waldron, who fatally shot a suspect who had already surrendered and then bullied his team into lying about what really happened. Danny is also murdered in the first episode, leaving AC-12 to try and piece together the mystery, unearthing police corruption going back years, with the discovery that Danny had been abused by the deceased suspect Ronan Murphy, and that the retired Chief Superintendent Patrick Fairbank had not only facilitated the abuse at Sandsview Boys' home, but even taken part. Season 3 was the show's peak for me, with the depths of the police corruption being exposed as being a lot bigger than first thought, capable of completely burying entire pieces of criminal history, yet still maintaining a good blend of different motivations for the characters involved. It covered some of the heaviest themes of the series, and did so to great effect, still managing to include a lot of action with the culmination of the caddy arc being the strongest season finale by a distance in my opinion, and giving the character of Lindsay Denton a very dramatic exit in the penultimate episode. 
Season 4 had the team investigate DCI Ross Huntley, an SIO returning from maternity leave who was ignoring substantial forensic findings that conflicted with her own line of inquiry. AC12 also found themselves searching for Tim Ifield, the forensic coordinator who disappeared after raising concerns about Roz, trying to get to the bottom of the mystery of Balaclava Man who had been murdering women and severely injured Steve when he got too close to the truth, as well as being betrayed by their own colleagues Jamie Desford and Minit Bindra who were being manipulated into working for Derek Hilton and the OCG. It was in Season 4 that we learned that the police had been infiltrated to an executive level with a debut outing for the codename H but it transpired that even Hilton, the primary antagonist for the season, was just a pawn to a much bigger operation. Whilst Season 4 has been maligned somewhat for its change in tone, stepping down the intensity from the ever-increasing action of Seasons 2 and 3, Hilton being a bit lacklustre for the season's main villain role, and having simply too many bent coppers, I felt it did a pretty solid job of showcasing the OCG's next moves in the aftermath of losing their longtime insider, finding new ways to keep tabs on AC12, reprising some elements of the first season such as the Balaclava Men, and got us wondering if there was any character we could truly trust entirely. Season 5 saw AC12 investigating John Corbett, an undercover officer embedded within the OCG itself, and one who appeared to have gone way off license. In a unique twist, Corbett never faced the famous AC12 interview, instead communicating only through Steve as a middleman, but as the story developed, it became more like an investigation of Ted, with the finger of blame pointed at him by John, with the assertion that Ted was in fact H hiding in plain sight. Whilst Season 5 came in for the most criticism of any Line of Duty season so far, with more and more bent coppers coming out of the woodwork at every turn, many of whom had recycled motivations, I honestly thought it still had a lot of positives, with the character of John, played by Stephen Graham, being one of the show's best, and it felt like an understandable continuation of the themes from Season 4, raising our suspicions about an officer like Ted who we had come to trust as the most honest of honest coppers. There was, however, one piece of lore that was pretty unanimously reviled by the viewer base, and that was the infamous Morse code retcon. In case you've forgotten, on reanalyzing the footage from Dot's dying declaration, it was discovered by Steve and Kate that the H Dot had been referring to was Morse code, with the Morse for H being four dots, suggesting that Dot himself was one of the four at the top of the OCG. To be frank, it's simultaneously implausible and not very compelling. It would take a video in itself to go over all the reasons why this was not a good piece of storytelling, nevertheless it did get us at least one more season of Line of Duty and continued one of the biggest mysteries in recent British television, so the ends may end up justifying the means. Some have even suggested that the team could be wrong and this could be another piece of misdirection, but I'm not even sure that would be an improvement, being fed such a pointless and unpopular red herring for that long just to sweep it back under the rug again. But my hopes are still high going into Season 6, even with the setbacks of filming through Covid and the complications that go with that. The cast, crew and Jed Mercurio himself have been very tight-lipped as usual, with any clues being extremely cryptic. But we do know a little, so let's look at what is going to be included in Line of Duty Season 6. The guest lead is DCI Joanne Davidson, played by Kelly MacDonald, and described as the most enigmatic adversary AC-12 have ever faced. The circumstances are that DCI Davidson is SIO of a murder investigation and her unconventional conduct raises suspicion at AC-12. It's going to be seven episodes rather than the usual six, and other new additions to the cast include Shalom Brun Franklin playing AC-12 new recruit DC Chloe Bishop, and actress and comedian Andy Osho playing the murder victim Gail Vela in Davidson's investigation. What do I expect from what's been released to the viewer in the build-up? Well, the cryptic clues like the Twitter photo of the Arnott's building in Belfast I think is just Jed winding us up. I wouldn't read anything into that, certainly not that Steve is secretly H. The majority of the show was told by following Steve and he's still recovering from being savaged by the OCG in Season 4. It just wouldn't make any sense. I'm not even convinced that Steve as H will be explored as a possibility in the coming season. Regarding DCI Davidson being described as enigmatic and her conduct labelled unconventional, I suspect they are going to go down the avenue of a mentally ill character or a character with some sort of social behavioural issues. There is nothing wrong with this if it's handled carefully. Joker was adored for its depiction of mental illness through the titular character, and it certainly opens up possibilities for a new set of motivations if the lead simply doesn't think or behave how AC-12 expect. However, when writing a character like that, you need to be careful to properly flesh them out with a personality, rather than letting them be defined by a one-dimensional trait. But I am optimistic for Kelly MacDonald's character, with the Season 6 trailer showing a subordinate officer talking presumably about DCI Davidson saying you don't know what she's capable of, similar to Harry Bain's description of Danny Waldron, a character whose trauma was instrumental in advancing the plot in the show's most gripping season. The OCG will naturally continue to try and draw information out of AC-12 to remain one step ahead, and the new DC Chloe Bishop seems like the one the team are going to suspect if information continues to be leaked. 
So I would like to see Hastings use Tony Gates' trick for finding a leak in his team from Season 1 by giving all possible candidates unique information and seeing which piece of information spreads. It would be a nice reprisal of something from the show's early days and highlight that AC12 learn from every case they handle. Something of that nature could be the bombshell Martin Compson has talked about coming in episode 4, and if that's the case then I think the treachery will be coming from someone a lot more established, and I think that's going to be Kate. Not that I think Kate is H, even though that is a popular theory at the moment, but I could see Kate being emotionally manipulated into serving that purpose. The OCG is very good at finding every officer's weakness, Kate is the main character with a family, and she has felt increasingly guilty about her work coming ahead of them in her priorities. If her family was under threat, Kate might be forced into doing inside work for the OCG to keep them safe. And since I do feel that Kate is overdue a big personal storyline, and the best team itself has never been infiltrated, that might be the very path to go down to add another layer to Kate's character. I certainly expect Kate as H will be explored, and the season 6 trailer definitely teased that idea, but if anything that has me more certain that the main villain won't be Kate, as I don't think the BBC would put the biggest twist in the promotional material. Jed also posted a clue to Twitter, referencing an obscured image from the film set with the hint that it was not Julia Montague. Julia Montague was Keely Hawes' character in another Mercurio drama The Bodyguard, and Keely also played the part of Lindsay Denton in seasons 2 and 3 of Line of Duty. There has been a lot of talk of departed characters like Denton, Gates and even Dot returning, maybe through flashbacks or video recordings, and I think returns for all of those characters is entirely possible. In general, there is a plethora of characters that could return, and I'm a sucker for a good redemption arc. With H knowing everything going on within the police hierarchy and Ted's hands a little more tied than usual being issued with a final warning regarding his conduct at the end of Season 5, wouldn't it be cool to have characters like Roz Huntley, Jackie Brickford and Mike Dryden orchestrate a vigilante operation that H would never see coming, still equipped with all of their own knowledge from their time on the force? Budget constraints are still a thing, and refilming everything because of the pandemic probably put a dent in that to begin with, but a whistle-stop tour of old adversaries and anti-heroes coming back to help out AC-12, maybe with their own set of self-serving motivations, would be really fun. On another note, I'm intrigued to see if what has gone on in the last year with Black Lives Matter and ideas such as defunding the police will have any impact on the series. Whilst Line of Duty has always had its own distinct identity and largely kept out of politics, it has handled sensitive issues like child abuse and institutional discrimination with care, and Jed is one of the few writers I would trust to navigate references to such socio-political matters in a way that would be both poignant and beneficial to the show. As for other things I expect to see in the series, I stand by my theory that Buckles is H. It seems to be the best foreshadowed, even though I'm sure Jed deliberately left numerous options open. Shoutouts for some of the other theories I've come across but not mentioned yet. Chief Inspector Osborne, who was Steve's superior during the botched counter-terror op in the very first scene. An easter egg containing a letter from Osborne that sought to shut down AC-12 would spur on this theory, but again, I would like to think the BBC wouldn't give the game away before the season had aired, and he's been away from the show for so long that it wouldn't really be a piece of misdirection if he was the villain, and to me wouldn't be entirely satisfying. So whilst it could be, I doubt it will be Osborne. Lisa McQueen Lisa seems like a really complex character and one who we still don't know very much about. I also doubt they would make someone that recent an addition into the main villain, and if I had to guess, I would say she is more likely a third party who doesn't trust the police but still wants to bring down H. The retired DC Morton If he isn't actually H, I do think it will still be explored as a line of inquiry. Morton was a really good character, and there was something very ominous about a sharper detective as him staying a DC for his whole career, so I wouldn't have any complaints if Morton was H. The last big question hanging over this season is if it will be the end of Line of Duty, and I don't think the story ends here. I think there will be a seventh season, the BBC I'm sure would be very eager to have one, Jed has said if the interest was there he would write it, and that almost seems like he's joking with us since the interest in Line of Duty is some of the biggest of any British series right now. So I expect we the viewer will know the identity of H by the end of the season, and then we will watch AC12 piece it together in season 7, much like we watched the cat and mouse game unfold between AC12 and Dot in seasons 2 and 3. Speaking of which, I'm also intrigued to see how things will play out with Ryan Pilkington joining the police to inherit the caddy role. Maybe he might start to have a change of heart when having to pretend to be on the side of the law, and could be brave enough to turn over a new leaf, learning from Dot's mistakes. Could there be an unlikely redemption arc for Ryan? It's questions like these which make me optimistic for season 6. There are good stories left to tell, and even though I think it's unlikely to fully recapture the heights of the second and third seasons, there is still so much room to make quality television here, and they have the right people to make that happen. Just a couple of final thoughts as I draw the video to a close. I'd like to see Steve win a fight for once, that's overdue, and I really want DS Sam Railson to get some more involvement in the story. I think there's the basis for a good character there, she's just been too contained to the personal life side of things and not enough of the bent coppers. Maybe Sam is a bent copper, it would give her something to do and might explain why she was so keen to keep Steve away from Lindsay, which always seemed over the top to me considering Steve didn't like Lindsay at all. Steve was literally the one who put Lindsay in jail. Maybe even Sam is a dark horse for H at a real push. 
But that's a wrap. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to join my best team. And most importantly, have a great day.